In this issue of Movies, we'll ride high with Matthew Broderick and the new John Hughes comedy, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We'll take you behind the scenes into the bizarre world of Terry Gilliam's Brazil. And check into the Bates Motel with Psycho 3. Word has it that Paul Newman and Tom Cruise are real hot shots in The Color of Money. And that Australian superstar Paul Hogan is a smash hit as Crocodile Dundee. You'll be shocked by the special effects and horrifying transformation of Jeff Goldblum in The Fly. You'll see what all of Hollywood is talking about. Michael Jackson in Captain EO, the newest attraction at Disneyland. We'll take an up-close look with Tom Cruise at his new mystical film, Legend. We'll jump into the saddle with Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short, the three amigos. And find out why Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines are running scared. We'll go into the glamorous world of two of Hollywood's hottest stars, the sensual Daryl Hannah and the sexy Leah Thompson. All this and more as Movies brings you what's happening in Hollywood today and tomorrow. What is so dangerous about a character like Ferris Bueller is he gives good kids bad ideas. Ferris Bueller, do you know him? Yeah, he's getting me out of summer school. I don't trust this kid any further than I can throw it. You just mind your P's and Q's, Buster, and remember who you're dealing with. Ferris Bueller. Matthew Broder is Ferris Bueller. One of the most charming characters ever created by writer-director John Hughes. Best known for The Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink. But just who is Ferris Bueller? Well, it isn't so much, it isn't, it isn't who Ferris Bueller is, it's where is Ferris Bueller. I'm taking the day off. Now get dressed and come on over. The film is called Ferris Bueller's Day Off and chronicles the exploits of three high school students playing hooky in the city of Chicago. Starring along with Matthew Broderick are Alan Ruck and Mia Serra. Ferris Bueller. He's the love of my life. Do you have a kiss for daddy? Are you kidding? Ferris Bueller is Zoltar, king of the universe. I recall Central Park in fall. How you saw your dress. What a mess. I confess. He's more than a person. He's an attitude and a, a way of life and sort of a leader of men, I think. I'd never seen a part like that, or a story like that. It was just so different from other things that it's that it was interesting, and it looked like the size of the part, the, the influence that the part has on everybody else just was, I just was fascinated by it. The 1961 Ferrari 250 GT, California. Father spent three years restoring this car. It is his love, it is his passion, it is his fault he didn't lock the garage. The wonderfully attractive thing about Ferris is that he has no restrictions. He sets no restrictions on himself. He will do anything, you know, to see if he can get away with it. <laughs> and he does, he gets away with everything. We like to be seated. Listen, young man, either you take the field trip outside or I'm going to have to call the police. The pol You're gonna call the police on me? Yes. Fine. As a matter of fact, I'll call him myself. <laughs> yes. 
Enjoy your lunch. Hmm? Cameron, dear friend, you thought we wouldn't have any fun. Shame on you. I think anybody, regardless of age, can benefit from looking at this sort of character, from seeing someone who, who uh, prefers life so much, you know? I mean, uh, I, don't th I think, I think it, it, it goes beyond just high school. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. With Ferris, I deliberately designed a character who can handle all of his problems, uh, who looks at the possibilities rather than the obstacles. What are we going to do? The question isn't what are we going to do. The question is what aren't we going to do. I had designed Ferris to be the guy that I always wanted to be. And I designed his fr best friend to be the guy that I usually am and that most people are. You know, as long as I've known him, everything works for him. There's nothing he can't handle. I can't handle anything. School, parents, future. Ferris can do anything. Ferris is the lord of leisure. He's the rajah of recreation. He is the master of ceremonies. One lesson. From the director of Time Bandits, Terry Gilliam, comes the brilliantly bizarre film Brazil. But there seems to be some confusion among its cast and crew as to what kind of film Brazil really is. What is Brazil? Mm. What is Brazil? What is Brazil? <laughs> That's a very difficult one to answer. It's half a dream and half a nightmare. The I mean, normally you have reality and dreams. But in this, you have dreams and nightmares. I guess you could say it's a, a farce and a romance. And it is a comment on society that to come, the future of the world. Brazil is uh, a dream, and it's uh, a fantasy, and it's uh, a comedy. But, I mean, to me, it's also, it's rather a chilling reality. Picture me in these. <laughs> There's something bizarre and extraordinary. This escape into the world of imagination and dreams. I want to report a wrongful arrest. Have you got an arrest receipt? Yeah. It's the depths of the psyche. It's the unconscious uglies. It's the, uh, it's the things you run away from. It's the things you don't want to see. It's a very funny piece, but there's a kind of sinister threat in it. But in visual terms, it's pure Gilliam. <laughs> When I first was writing this film, I had Jonathan in mind. As we were rewriting it, we were going to think he was, needed to be a younger character. And he read it and he called me up and said, I want to do it. I just said, OK, I'll humor him and give him a screen test. He did this thing. And I said, well, that's it. He's, he's got the party. My involvement with Terry Gilliam goes back a few years ago. And he's very much an individual in his approach to his work. Each day is... Uh, as a challenge for Terry, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very good to be able to fulfill, or to want to fulfill, his imagination. Uh, into memory, central banking. I had worked as a clerk for the ministry for the information retrieval 
sort of computer type client who, from the greyness of life, basically dreams uh, of, of another life, of being a sort of Superman hero figure. I'm sorry, boys, but we haven't got any vacancies. We've got no vacancies. We've got plenty of room. Oh, it's all right, so we take a room. room? Who's there? Kim was sort of thrust into this crowd of real pros. She's fine, terrific. Yeah, she's got a good character in there. And I, I, I know it's going to sound incredible, but um, but I've been dreaming about you. No, 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 not like that. I mean, I love you. I mean, in my dreams. I mean, I, it's extraordinary, good. isn't it? So she's very good here. Oh, yeah. She... Yeah. Good looking, sexy. Just my type. I just don't deserve such terrific luck. Damn right. Jack really is the sort of man who likes to look right and likes to have everybody around him looking right, even his wife. Alison. Sam Lowry, old friend. Alison, yes, of course. Mm. Well, you look different. Well, I'm two years older. And she's been to Dr. Jaffe. Ah, she doesn't like me telling people, but in fact, she's really pleased. I knew there was something different. Remember how they used to stick out? What? Oh, yes. Um, well, rather, I always used to wonder if they were real. What, my ears? Sorry? Dr. Jaffe pins her ears back. Yes, that's right. Always used to wonder if she wore false ears. Oh, Mr. Hellman. Alice. False ears. Sorry. That was a fine cut. <laughs> See? <laughs> my job in Brazil was to age Catherine from 70 to 40. This meant making her look older at first, then making her look younger afterwards. And already she's twice as beautiful as she was before. Voila! Mm -hmm. This is Catherine Hellman's head. What I've got to do now is sculpt in clay all the bags and wrinkles that make her look older. This can take a week or two. What I do next is make a latex copy of the clay modelling that's been done on his face, which looks something like this. I first met Terry Gilliam on the telephone. It seems that he was doing a film called Time Bandits, and he said, hello, want to come and do a film with a crazy American? He said then that he had an idea for a crazier film than Time Bandits, but he didn't think anybody would ever give him the money to do it. Arnon Milson is producing. Uh, they had done, just done King of Comedy and was doing Once Upon a Time in America, both starring De Niro. Action! Arnon was saying, well, why don't we get someone like Bobby De Niro to be in the thing? And I just didn't consider that sort of thing. He's far too big a name for the likes of us. It was only to the last minute he finally said yes. And it became such a battle, us trying to convince him, at the same time trying to tell him it was going to be very difficult. <laughs> Why? I came into this game for the action, the excitement. Go anywhere, travel light, get in, get out, wherever there's trouble, a man alone. He's got an amazing screen presence. I mean, there's a strange animal magnetism there. The minute he comes into the, into the film, you feel it. There's something in here. And for him, this was a very difficult thing, because he's never done a bit part in a film. I mean, he's the star of a film, always. In a strange way, he's turned out to be the most important relationship for the Sam character in there. Who was that? As a friend of mine, he... There are no nice, cozy, domestic scenes. No long car shots where you can get in nice music. They wanted me to do this massive explosion out of the kitchen. But that was quite a problem. We couldn't make loud bangs in case the glass cracked. And the whole place was glass. It had a glass roof, glass walls. So we used these gas guns. And then we'd do lots of tests and we'd calculate just how far people in the restaurant can sit away from the ball of fire without getting their hair singed. George Gibbs is doing the special effects. And he just finished Raiders, too. And he says this one is harder. <laughs> It's like lifting the top off Terry Gilliam's skull. It's mad. And glimpsing inside. And it's wonderful. It's entering Terry Gilliam land. It's, it's, it's Franz Kafka meets Walter Mitty. It's fine. <laughs> Very strange. 
Sorry. Oh, let me rephrase it. It's fine. It's great. In 1960, the movie Psycho shocked audiences with its stylized violence and hair-raising atmosphere of suspense. In 1983... Norman Bates is judged, restored to sanity, and is ordered released. Those emotions were ignited once more as Norman Bates returned in Psycho 2. And now he's back again in Psycho 3. Anthony Perkins recreates his most famous role. In Psycho 3, Norman has, has some problems on his hands to start with. But I think Norman kind of reverts back in some ways to Psycho 1, where the, the, the problems he faces are so great that he, he like, forgets that they're there. Do you go out with Ren? Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. In Psycho 3, Perkins not only acts, but makes his directorial debut, a task he finds both challenging and rewarding. Balancing is probably the, the most important thing you can do. If, if you're directing yourself in a motion picture and you show up with your head so full of directing, then your performance will suffer. And if all you can think of is your lines, then perhaps you won't get any good angles. <laughs> Casting was a, a page from Hitchcock's book who said that, that the performance of the, of the actor is really more in the the intelligence of the casting by the, by the director than, than anything that the director can, can presume to contribute. For the female lead in Psycho 3, Anthony Perkins chose the Academy Award-nominated actress Diana Scarwood. As I lay there, I saw the Virgin standing above me, and her arms were outstretched as though she were beckoning me. Oh, Father. What did you want of me? Maureen is a tormented novitiate, too full of um, fear and pain, like Norman, to function in the world. I just wanted to thank you for what you did. Well, I can't have that sort of thing going on in my motel. Gives the place a bad name. <laughs> I guess I did leave the bathroom a mess. I've seen it worse. The character that Scarwood plays brings back to Norman memories of an ill-fated blonde who once rented a room at the Bates Motel. Speaker. Producer Hilton Green was instrumental in the making of all three psychos. Well, I was uh, Mr. Hitchcock's assistant director in television when uh, he decided to make Psycho with his television crew because of the speed that he had to shoot the picture in. And that's how I worked with him for the first time on a feature. We, we were very lucky to get someone who's been working on the Psycho pictures since the very first one. On the first Psycho, he was the first assistant director. On the second, he was the, the uh, line producer. And on the third, he was more or less the executive producer and line producer. The original Psycho was very unique for its day. The censors wouldn't allow you to photograph anything with a, a lot of violence. But it was shot in such a way that uh, the knife never penetrated the body. There was never a shot of a cut or blood or anything. The only blood in it was at the end uh, down the drain. I'm letting it lie and so are you, you understand? That young lady and Mrs. Spool are both missing person cases. Don't tell me my job, Ms. Venable. Well, somebody... Uh, in Psycho 3, uh, we don't want to show the, uh, the brutality and the gashes, yet uh, we want to frighten people, we want it to be exciting, and we want it to be remembered. We all go a little mad sometimes. The tradition of terror continues in Psycho 3. Paramount Pictures cordially invites you for a weekend getaway at the party to end all parties. This is the craziest party that could ever be. 
Welcome to my home. And lifestyles of the rich and undeserving. Wrong. Uh, cheers. Join eight privileged guests who are just dying <laughs> to have fun. <laughs> wow, what is this? The bridal suite? You like it? The ladies. I find a use for it. The gentlemen. <laughs> we, we, we did on the first date. The young. Well, basically, I possess a, an essential lack of seriousness. And the restless. You are such a jerk. Everyone is having such a good time. It's scary. Is something wrong? You're dead. Radio is blasting. Someone's knocking at the door. April Fool's Day. Get ready to party till you drop. Paul Hogan's Crop Out Dundee has broken all Australian box office records, including those held by E.T. and Star Wars. That's what I expected. <laughs> now, the film, uh, the biggest grossing film ever shown in Australia, and, and that's terrific because most of the films that work in Australia are American. Australians don't flock along to Aussie films. They go to American films. So the ones we had to knock off were the, you know, the, the Rambos and ETs and Star Wars and things like that. And we did knock them off, and that's, that's a surprise. Must be the right film at the right time. And I think when we opened in the States, it's, I think it's the biggest fall opening of all time. That's what I'm told. And so I like those all-time words and words like ever. I'm happy. The satisfaction is in writing it, not doing it. You know, I don't think of myself as being Sir Lawrence Olivia, but uh, I wrote down what I think's funny. And then people go to the theatre and they laugh at the places I wanted them to. And that's the satisfaction. We never had any Daniel Boones or Davy Crockett's or Robin Hood type people in our very short history. I mean, it is very short, you know, we're the youngest country in the world. It's only, we've only been there 200 years. And it's only been a, a country for like 80 years. So um, we had a sort of a bush ranger named Ned Kelly who used to rob banks badly with a bucket over his head. That was the only guy they ever made movies about. So if we don't have any folk heroes, I'll make one up. And that's what I did. Paul Hogan is Crocodile Dundee. Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, in a Martin Scorsese picture. He's got the eye, he's got the stroke, he's got the flick. Vincent's the best. We got a racehorse here, a thoroughbred. You make him feel good, I teach him how to run. I'm not your daddy, I'm not your boyfriend, so don't be playing games with me. I'm your partner. I love this. You're an incredible flake. But that's a gift. I made money. I lost money. I got half of me that says I got a hold of the best thing that I ever seen, and half of me that says it just ain't worth it. Why'd you take a walk? 500 bucks says you choke right now. You used me! Yes, I did. Now I'm gonna leave. Ah. This is Fast Eddie Felson. Who the hell are you? 25 years ago, I won my share of medals. But it was over for me before it really got started. Hungry again. See some heavy legend action. I won his best game. You want my game? You couldn't deal with my game, Jack. You're outmanned. I'm gonna beat him, you know. What makes you so sure? Touchstone Pictures presents. You smell what I smell? Smoke? Money. The color of money.
Black Moon Rising is an action-packed thriller based on a story by John Carpenter. It stars Tommy Lee Jones and Linda Hamilton. The film gets its title from an experimental car named the Black Moon, which is powered by hydrogen and capable of speeds in excess of 300 miles per hour. Here goes. When we first see this futuristic prototype, it is being tested by its builders. According to director Harley Coakless, casting the car proved even more difficult than casting the actors. We knew we needed a really remarkable car, and we went through all the magazines and looked at this and looked at that. And then we heard about a car that was up in Montreal, which was designed by a French designer for the, Monterey, uh, the Montreal Car Expo. So we brought it down to L.A. and made a few modifications, and, uh, and that's the Black Moon. Producer Joel Michaels quickly realized that their Black Moon would not be merely a show car. We did with that car what it was never intended to do, and that was run and chase and do stunts and leap and jump and do somersaults. Enabled the filmmakers to shoot two scenes simultaneously. In the film, the Black Moon is stolen by an international car theft ring, whose leader is played by veteran actor Robert Vaughn. The Black Moon is stored on an upper floor of the thieves' headquarters. When Tommy Lee Jones and Linda Hamilton try to steal it back, they find themselves trapped with only one way out, the window. Stunt coordinator Bud Davis explains the difficulty of the stunt. Uh, they're using real glass in this stunt, which is different than the normally the candy glass or tempered glass because this breaks up into big shards, and that's the look that they want for the slow motion. It is a little more dangerous, and uh, that's why the driver has to take a little more protection. In this particular case, the driver will be wearing helmet, uh, chest protector, knee, and shin guards, and uh, he'll be very well protected, and I know that for sure because it's me. From the cast to the car to the special effects, Black Moon Rising was designed to provide non-stop action and thrills. The film should really be a roller coaster. It should be a, almost a, an amusement arcade ride. It should kind of catch you up in its adventure and, and drive you 300 miles an hour through the streets of Los Angeles. Scientist Seth Brundle thinks he's about to master a revolutionary concept in transportation, the instantaneous transmission of a human being through space. But Seth Brundle is not alone. The brilliant scientist has instead mastered another revolutionary concept, genetic fusion. He will soon become a hideous mutant. Seth Brundle's bizarre and terrifying metamorphosis is the subject of 20th Century Fox's remake of the 1958 classic, The Fly. How are you doing? May you tell me? Am I different somehow? It's a nightmare. I mean, it's, it's a movie that tells a story about a guy who is beginning to change, and he can exercise no control over that change. All right, quiet, please. Uh, there's a reflection right over her face from this angle right now. <laughs> Directed by David Cronenberg and starring Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis, this new and horrifying version of The Fly is based on an entirely different premise than the original film. In the original, uh, a man and a fly basically switch heads, and uh, you have this sort of instant monster created. In this film, when he comes out of the receiving pod, he is perfectly normal, but the fly has disappeared. His body has assimilated the fly, and more than that, it has fused with the fly on a genetic level. And then gradually he begins to realize that he's not turning into a 185 pound fly, but in fact is turning into a creature that never really existed before. Oh, hi. What's this? It's an attempt to distract me, that's what it is. No, really, what is this? It's like hairs or something. Brundle's transition from a man to an insect-like creature is a slow and insidious one. Chris Wavos, who brought Steven Spielberg's Gremlins to life, created each phase of Goldblum's metamorphosis. We're taking a, a main character and bringing him from his a very, very human uh, form all the way through subtle skin color changes to sores and um, 
creating finally him in his uh, uh, stage that's just horribly degenerated and then pass that to another stage which is an entirely new being <laughs> finally get uh, claustrophobic you could kind of freak out I mean you're covered in, in, in this thing and, and, and it's exhausting too not only you're in this thing and it's kind of very hot but in part of the makeup my, my whole uh, there's kind of this weight on my eyes all the time and to kind of see I have to keep doing that you know so it's very very exhausting Seth? I don't know up here oh. eventually the creature is able to crawl up walls and across the ceiling to create this illusion, director Cronenberg had a special set built. There really is only one respectable way to do that, and that is to build a set that actually revolves. As he's walking, the, f the ceiling becomes the floor, and the camera ultimately ends up upside down with the cameraman, and we have our actor on the what looks like the ceiling, but in fact is the floor. At this point, the fly is very um, messy, and he likes to eat things that are sugary and sweet, and so we have donuts and decaying rolls and all kinds of stuff all over the place, and all of these have to be nailed and bolted and glued down so that when the set turns upside down, everything just doesn't fall and, and reveal what's going on. So it's actually very, very tricky to do. So I would say the detailing of what happens to the relationships and to this man physically and emotionally are will i could tell you about it for days and you still i think would 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 not be prepared for what happens to him in the film okay okay that's it you're going to like it i don't want to i'm afraid don't be afraid no be afraid be very afraid hottest ticket in Hollywood these days is to the new Disneyland attraction, Captain EO, a 17-minute futuristic fantasy film shot entirely in 3D. This film makes use of the newest state-of-the-art technology available to filmmakers today. Captain EO was directed by Francis Ford Coppola, produced by George Lucas, and stars Michael Jackson in his first big screen appearance. You know, I think if we were to single out one Thing that Michael contributed was enthusiasm. Uh, he was um, always pushing us further for, you know, to make this the best possible film that could be made, and and um, he was always very cooperative, and and um, that's a big help. He also contributed on, you know, on the story ideas and went over the scripts and would put in ideas and and um, in the shooting process and in uh, the editing process. Uh, he would always contribute his point of view. Um, that's sort of over and above his the obvious talent as a singer and a dancer. If the initial audience reaction to Captain EO is any indication, the folks at Disney have created a phenomenon once again. In this edition of Movies, we take an up-close and revealing look at the film Legend through the eyes of its star, Tom Cruise. In this fantasy adventure film, Cruise plays Jacko the Green, a legendary woodsman who lives the free life of a hermit. 
he's a spirit, actually. He's a very spiritual character. And he, uh, he's light as opposed to darkness. He is love and life. And the character has a great uh, capacity for love. And he's, he's part of the forest. Playing opposite Cruz is the distinguished British actor Tim Curry as the demonic Lord of Darkness. Tim Curry played Darkness, and I unfortunately I didn't have a whole lot of scenes with him, uh, so I didn't really work with him that much. But when I did work with him, he was very, uh, very, very generous artist. You know, uh, great sense of humor, very relaxed, and. Uh, I mean, you have to be when you have six hours of makeup a day and three hours at night to get it off. <laughs> Poor guy. And uh, I really, I, I really enjoyed meeting him. And you know, <clears throat> and uh, Mia was. I mean, it was very difficult for her because it was her first movie. I mean, she's just a young girl, and to be on the big sets and working on a movie, you know. First of all, just your first thing, just, I mean, she's in high school coming in and doing it, and, uh, uh, I mean, it was, <clears throat> it was tough, you know? I mean, she did a terrific job, and it was, it was very tough. Are you afraid to kiss me, Jack? I'm afraid you'll break my heart. And still you Tom is a very sweet, very unique kind of person. I mean, I don't really... I was very nervous to meet him because I thought, oh, God, he's going to have a head this big and I'm going to hate him, but he really doesn't. You're dear to me as life itself. Don't you wish this was our wedding ring? If I say yes, Throughout the relentless production of this film, Cruz found his inspiration from director Ridley Scott. I have a lot of respect for the man as a human being and an artist. He, uh, I just, I, I, I like to work hard when I'm doing something. You know, I mean, I just go for it all out, and that's... That's exactly how he is. I mean, he's just relentless. Uh, we would work long hours, and uh, I mean, he would go out and play tennis, and afterwards, you know, and he worked seven days a week on the film. And uh, I just, uh, knowing that, I mean, he's just, he's a fantastic artist. I, I just, it's terrific. I will marry whoever finds this ring. It appears that legend has all the ingredients to become a fantasy film classic. I would like people to feel good after seeing legend. Just uh, like they've had a good time, you know. Station Starfleet Emergency Red Alert. Earth is on the edge of destruction. We cannot survive unless a way can be found to respond to the probe. The key to saving the future. Spock, you're talking about the end of every life on Earth. Can be found only in the past. We're going to attempt 
time travel. Sulu, take us home. These are the voyages of the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived at the latter half of the 20th century. Stardate, 1986. San Francisco. Our own world is waiting for us to save it. They have 24 hours. Everybody remember where we parked. Break up. To complete their mission. It looked like a cadet review. We will beam in tonight, collect the photons, and beam out. I want you all to be very careful without being discovered. We have an intruder. All right, who are you? You're not exactly catching us at our best. That much is certain. This is an extremely primitive and paranoid culture. What does it mean, exact change? Many of their customs will doubtless take us by surprise. We're ready for beam out. My transporter power is down to minimal. I've got to bring in one at a time. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Let's do our job and get out of here. Free! Take off, can you hear me? Stop is the 23rd century. Full power now, son. Shields at maximum. Steady. Hold on tight, lassie. Can we make breakaway speed? That's all I can give you. Book eight. Eight foot one. Book nine. Now. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Looking for some new career challenge. Yeah, something with a future. Show me another career they let you shoot people. Give us your money. You're mugging us? I don't believe it. You better believe it or you're dead. Oh, come on. Let us keep the driver's licenses and the snapshots. And our badges. I can't believe that you missed all six shots. What are you talking about? It's the windshield six times in a row. I'm the one who made him swerve. Oh, you made him swerve? Yes, you sir. You always aim low anyway. Oh, good. Nagging me. Now, nagging is good. You owe me 10 bucks that I never said anything. You want it now? Yeah, I want it now. Did I come at a bad time? Follow that car. Oh, now you're going to criticize my driving? Well, just that you get to do all the dangerous stuff and I get to parallel park. I love this job. <laughs> <laughs> Thompson takes center stage in the new hit comedy, Howard the Duck, as the aspiring young rock star, Beverly Switzler. This role offered Leah many unique opportunities, one of which was performing her own songs in the film. In addition to portraying a glamorous rock star, Leah met another challenge. In the film, she falls in love with a talking duck from another planet. You really are the worst. He's different in the sense that he has feathers and a beak. You know, when they said you have this love scene, you know, I kind of had to think about that for a minute. But it ended up really good. He's real sexy. Another test of the young actress's talents came when she had to shoot the climactic confrontation scene with the movie's villain. Well, when we did the, the final battle, we had to imagine that we were disintegrating, Tim Robbins and I and we, we were getting disintegrated by this huge monster. After a certain point, you know, you feel a little foolish, but you just gotta go for it. And just go, ay, 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 ay. I couldn't do it for more than like five seconds without cracking up. With blockbuster hits like Red Dawn, Back to the Future, and now Howard the Duck, Leah Thompson is becoming one of Hollywood's most promising new stars. The jury's back, and the verdict is Daryl Hannah is hot in Legal Eagles. Her role in this film is very different from the sexy mermaid she played in the hit comedy Splash. Still uncomfortable? 
You bet. Daryl Hannah's role is a very strange one in this film because you're not ever sure whether she's guilty or innocent. Did you steal the painting? No. Yes. Yes, but no. Well, which is it? Both. On one moment, she's this odd, wake-like creature. Someone's following me. What? I'm scared. Who? How did you? Can I come in? And another moment, she's this extraordinarily glamorous, beautiful woman. Chelsea Dearden is a performance artist who um, is accused of murder and um, stealing a painting. And a lot of the research that was done on my part was really about performance art and trying to figure out what exactly to do with the piece. The piece started out being, um, in, in Ivan's mind, he had, he had the idea of having five very large photographs. The piece uses um, some photographs, it uses slides. It uses and I saw a car burning on the side of the road. This piece was supposed to be a seduction scene, really. Old flame. The heat is on when Daryl Hannah ignites the screen with her performance in Legal Eagles. And here's what's happening in Hollywood. Soon to be released is Soul Man. This new comedy stars C. Thomas Howe and Ray Don Chong. Howe portrays a young college student who chemically darkens his skin so he can attend Harvard Law School on a minority scholarship. Also coming soon is Something Wild, starring Melanie Griffith and Jeff Daniels. This romantic thriller tells the story of a beautiful and alluring young woman whose dangerous exploits unleash the suppressed desires of a conservative tax accountant. You'll soon be seeing Dee Wallace in the new psychological thriller, Shadow Play. Wallace portrays Morgan Hanna, a playwright who is tormented by her reoccurring nightmares. Richard Jordan and Sarah Douglas are among the stars of Solar Babies, a science fiction adventure of wonder and courage set in the distant future. And from Australia comes the movie Bliss. This offbeat domestic comedy was directed by Ray Lawrence and stars Barry Otto and Lynette Curran. The 1980 Tony Award-winning play, Children of a Lesser God, comes to the motion picture screen. It stars William Hurt as James Leeds, a teacher of hearing-impaired children who falls in love with a deaf woman named Sarah Norman, portrayed by newcomer Marley Matlin. That's it for this volume. Join us soon for more exclusive Hollywood previews on movies.